Okay, uh, during the break, um, I was asked about the uh, Euclidean ball, how come uh, the Bessel function is involved in the, in the, uh, the Poincare constant, because the Bessel function is very much nonlinear, right? It oscillates a lot. Uh, but the answer is that I think the first eigenfunction, you don't take the part where it oscillates, you take the, the, some Bessel function, you truncate it at the first zero of its derivative, maybe, the first uh, uh, local maximum or minimum. And then you rescale it and make it a radial function, and then multiply by linear function. So the, the eigenfunction of the Euclidean model is still not that far from being a linear function. So you just take some in, small interval from the Bessel function, which it does not oscillate. This was a question. Maybe there, there is more questions. Yes, Dario. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. So it's a fi so um, right. We, we discussed it. Okay, let me answer now. So if there is a we say that it's a random vector is isotropic. X in our random vector we say it's isotropic. Uh, if it's if um, it's covariance is the identity. So if it's centered and the covariance is the identity matrix. Okay, so it's, uh, and this is, this corresponds to a, a linear, ch a fine chain of variables. So given any, um, any distribution with finite second moments, you, you can apply standard transformation, or uh, in your language, uh, as a question, you can choose the corresponding uh, uh, quadratic form there. And, and, and case conjecture is equivalent to the isotropic case. So it's equivalent to the question whether, um, for any isotropic low concave, uh, the um, Poincare constant is bounded by some universal constant. So universal. Okay. So if if so, you could say that this is the canonical uh, Euclidean norm, the one induced by the isotropic uh, constant by the covariance structure. Is that what you asked? Something else. Yeah, I was wondering if the norm is taking two polynomials or one possible equation, and that's what you could get more or less the same. OK, you can get the generate thing. So you can get, like, if you can have some Euclidean sources such that makes these things almost one dimensional, and then get that it's two for one, you know, for very rigid degenerate situation where you. So at least if you take a non invertible Lyon transformation, then, I mean, uh, yeah, in one dimension, it's correct. So if you project it to one dimension, then the Poincare constant is just, um, um, you can have some degenerate things, like the, the, the operator of the commands matrix is just in one direction, and this dominates, and the other, so, yeah. I would say that this is a natural quadratic norm. OK, more questions? So I proceed. I, I was in the middle of a long, long series of examples. Example number four, example number four, is the Gaussian measure. X Gaussian, so X uh, in Rn, standard Gaussian random vector in Rn. So in this case, it is the covariance is one identity. So operator norm is one. Poincare constant is also one. This can be computed either by Bochner method or by Hermit polynomial. Let's say Hermit polynomial. This is amphitheater. OK. By Hermit decomposition, uh, you can uh, compute the, the, the Poincare constant. And you see that here you have equality in the, uh, uh, let's say, trivial part of the, of the KLS. So here we know that linear functions are exactly saturated for Poincare inequality. So linear functions. So these things are equal. The operator norm is equal to one. Here are functions exactly saturate and are, are extremes for the Poincare inequality in this case. Uh, okay, so it's a very good example to study in the context of the of the Keres conjecture. And in fact, if you play a bit with Hermit polynomials, you can get more things, and and, and more is known. So uh, uh, some more information. 
so pretty much, um, okay, if you have, uh, you can replace linear functions in a sense by some low degree polynomials. Um, so for my, mid, for my middle composition, uh, the composition, what you get is that um, if uh, f is a polynomial of the grip mos d, then it also nearly saturates the Poincare inequality, and this is small, so d uh, not large. Then say degree two, three, something like that. Then f roughly saturates, nearly saturates the Poincare inequality. Because uh, so in this case, you can say that the expectation of grad f square is at most d times the equation of f square. So here we have the reverse to the Poincare inequality, okay, in this case. And in fact, moreover, any, uh, any function that nearly saturates Poincare correlates with some, uh, that nearly saturates Poincare correlates with, uh, uh, correlates with some low degree polynomial. So again, by Hermit expansion, so if, if f is any function, uh, where the, uh, well, you have the reverse inequality up to some factor, I think I wrote r in the notes, then there exists some p uh, polynomial for any d if you want. For any d, uh, uh, there exists some polynomial p of the grid most d, which approximates f um, uh, r over d plus one. Yeah. So you can have some, this means uh, expectation of uh, uh, f of x minus p of x square. Yeah. So you can find a polynomial of, degree, of small degree which kind of cancels the small frequencies and the tail is decays fast, so, so you can approximate by low degree polynomial. So for the Gaussian, we pretty much understand um, what saturates Poincare, low degree polynomials, or things which are close to low degree polynomials. That, that's it. Um, good. Uh, next, next example. From the beginning. No, this is, this is very special for the Gaussian. Let me show you an example which is different now. More questions? Someone did some? I don't think, no. It's easier, I would say. It's much, much easier. So, so you just say that uh, the two quadratic, our mid polynomials diagonalize both orthogonal with respect to both L2 structure and integral of grad square. So just compute, it's, it's, it's completely algebraic and elementary things, these, these facts. Uh, you can advance, of course, but this is very, very easy. More questions? Yes, please, yeah, please. Very good question. Let me try to answer it. So this is the next example. So example five, the exponential, as Beatrice suggested, let's try to study it. Uh, okay, so the exponential measure, if you allow, let me do it in, in uh, even dimensions only. Is it okay, Beatrice, R2n? I think she'll manage. Okay, so let's, let's work in, uh, uh, um, say, say we work in, in, in R2n, in even dimension, which we prefer to look at a Cn. And let's look at the following measure. So d mu to d, this is Lebesgue. And this would be just exponential, so. Uh, 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 e to the minus sum of, 
for Zj. OK? So this is the measure. And you normalize by 2 pi 2 dn. So it's a probability, I, I think, yeah. This is a probability measure. I swear, right? Yeah. So this is a probability. This is log concave probability measure. OK, in, in Cn, which is pretty much the exponential. It's, it's a small variant of the exponential. I just prefer to incorporate it because it's a bit more clean. Then I, I think the covariance is also is 3, apparently. Good. So you compute, of course, it's a diagonal matrix because it's, independent random, it's a product measure, independent random variables. So it's clear that these are zeros. And you yeah, it's, it's, it get it 3. And also, I will not do the, also this, it's not a counterexample to the KLS conjecture. So this is a, indeed as the order of magnitude of 1. It may be proved. OK. But now let, let's think what happens. So is it true that functions that nearly saturate Poincare inequality look like polynomials here? Um, so the answer is no, it's not true. And in fact, here, there is an infinite dimensional space of functions uh, that nearly saturate Poincare. So the spectrum is not discrete, even. It's a nearly saturate Poincare. Um, OK, and, and, and we have actually the following uh, uh, claim is that uh, if f is holomorphic, so, so suppose that f is a holomorphic function, maybe polynomial even, any holomorphic polynomial, uh, be holomorphic uh, in L2 of mu uh, with integral f d mu equals 0. Actually, this is equivalent. Equivalently, this means that if you think a bit, this just means that f vanishes at the origin. The last condition is, is this is what it because for a lot of fun, you know, you do, do the Cauchy integral, you get it. Um, so this is an infinite dimensional space of functions, all polynomials, all homomorphic polynomials are there. If you don't remember what's homomorphic in n variables, you can either think on dimension one, okay, or uh, think of a function which is, say, continuous or smooth, and separately homomorphic in each of the variables. So, uh, I don't know, z1 to the 5 times sine z2. Okay. Anyway, so if you have some function, then the claim is that uh, there is no, so this thing is always uh, almost determined, ah, non zero. This is between two constants, which I, uh, one quarter and one six, I think. Uh, no, one half and one third. Ah, I know why I made this mistake. Yeah. OK, so there are many, many functions that do saturate. Uh, you can, they can be far away from all degree polynomials. It could be orthogonal to all polynomials of degree at most 1,000. OK, so let's, let's explain. Uh, OK, so this was a phenomena, a Gaussian phenomenon. In fact, the exponential is kind of the almost, all, is the extreme, is the problematic uh, distribution in, in many cases in this analysis. Also in Joseph's lectures, you would see that somehow the, the method of proof that gives to the log n also stuck uh, for the exponential. Some space tabular is just not true for the exponential. Yeah, so the exponential is the extreme log case measure. It just decays exponentially. It usually log case measure decays faster than, at least as fast as exponential. And uh, yeah, also there is some, some issues. OK, so let's explain this fact. Well, no, it couldn't be that difficult. Let me just do it for n equals 1, uh, although it's the same proof in all dimensions. Um, so um, I claim it's enough to check for, uh, for z to the k. So these are because so the distribution is, is radially symmetric. So if you walk in c, e to the minus z is radially symmetric. And these things would be orthogonal. So they are, so uh, uh, this is an orthogonal, this is, uh, 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 these are, they are orthogonal. And also, um, so, okay, so z to dk times z to dl is zero if l is not, is not equal to k in l to mu, just because, uh, you know, on each circle, the integral will be zero. And same for the derivatives. And, same for, and, and, and for the derivatives as well, 
So if you decompose into Taylor series, um, then this would, this would become a sum, and this would become a sum, and so it's enough to prove for these things. If it's true for each of them, it's true in general. And now, for z to decay, so just the alternative of the composition, and for z to decay, just compute. For z to decay, and then 10. Oh, uh, uh, for z to decay, uh, so what's the, let's see, so what's the L2 norm of, of z to decay with respect to mu? So it's uh, the, the well, integral of the sphere, 1 over 2 pi. Okay, this would cancel. And I'll get integral of 0 to infinity. And it, it polar coordinates. It's going to be R2k uh, e to the minus R, R dr. So these things just cancel. And you get gamma function, you get 2k plus 1 factorial. And if you look at the derivative, uh, so this would be k square. So the derivative is k times e to the k minus 1. So I get k square. And then the same with 2k minus 1 plus 1 e to the minus r dr. So I'm going to get k square to k minus 1 factorial. And these two numbers are always um, between two, one, uh, uh, related by two constants. Just two constants down these two things, because you see that you get 2k two, two plus 2k in this thing. So that is fine. OK, and, and, and the delta norm of the derivative is up to factor 2, the of the gradient. So this is why it's true for the exponential measure. OK. Um, question, Alexandros? Can you see the function? Can you see the real function to define the new thing there? The real part. The real part of zeta decay would be. So the harmonic function. Yes. In the plane, yes. Or plural harmonic in, 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 in CN. Yeah, sure. The, yeah, yeah, good. Yeah. The real part would be, or the imaginary part would be the same. So. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, yeah. And there is some reduction of KLS to harmonic functions or to uh, uh, even to holomorphic functions. These things are, things are a bit more. Okay. Um, more questions? Yes. Loud, loud, loud. Yeah. Ah, up to universal constant. Okay. So F nearly saturates. Uh, P inequality if uh, if uh, uh, of, uh, integral of if if you have the reverse inequality. Some well. Uh, CP of mu times L2 norm up to some um, small factor, bounded factor. So if, if saturates with the equality case, and if you have it, the reverse inequality up to factor, uh, no. Up to bounded factor here, sorry. So up to, let's say, 10. You start with if, if this is too up to f so you know that always this is smaller. This is you know, you know this without a factor ten by definition. If you have it up to factor ten, I call it nearly saturates. Okay, this is the of some universal constant. This is a bit of a slang. Nearly saturates it depends on some parameter, but that means that the reverse inequality holds up to a small factor. This is for me nearly saturates. Yes, please. Um, so if you okay, so there is something called uh, the technical is, is Reinhardt. So if you have the distribution, it depends only on the absolute values of the coordinates. So in this case, um, you, it was e to the minus absolute value of z1. 
In this case, you kind of have a basis, orthogonal basis, which is the polynomial to be orthogonal to each other. And then, yes, indeed, all, all that remains is the tails for the estimating what you get for the polynomials. So for the exponential, it's okay. Of course, if you slightly perturb the exponential, it will still be okay. It's not a, yeah. So, and there are things like, for instance, if you know, so that uh, uh, if you, this is your density, suppose in R now, forget about the complex thing. Suppose, suppose this is your low concave density, okay? Um, so if the convex function is a thing they call it coercive, if you know that it, it, it has to go at least linearly to infinity because it's a convex function, if it goes super linearly, um, then this implies what, what we, I'll just say it for expert, this is called this implies discrete spectrum. So in particular, um, that you cannot have infinite dimensional space of functions that you set of Poincaré. It's uh, um, to be, so this, this you, you must have it, uh, uh, it must behave sort of exponentially. So you must know that Psi does not go super at infinity for having such a phenomenon of a huge space of functions that, that nearly set of Poincaré. Yes, please. Uh, with respect to the universe. Uh, no, so inversal constant is just, a, okay, the, the idea is um, a numerical constant. So it's a... Uh, you, you, can, you can keep the constant based on the function. So you select the function and then you, you compute some constant which would be vector to the power of nine. Yes, yes, you can abuse this concept, sure, yeah, yeah. So, um, in, in every theorem, when I say universal constant, when I form it a theorem, it means that it's actually numerical, a number, five, two pi, usually it's something like pi or e, something like that. I just don't bother to write it down. In fact, these are always, in these lectures, and Joseph, always effective constants. So in principle, you can write, in, in place of universal constant in the theorem, you can write 500 or 200 or some explicit numbers. These are all constructible, effective uh, uh, numerical constants. So these are in the theorems. Now, when I do some intuitive discussion, um, you are right that I'm not completely careful about what I mean when I say nearly saturate. Okay, so I, I mean that up to a factor which is, looks to me small, not like, I don't know, five, it's not, it's not a completely precise notion when I say function nearly saturates Poincaré. But when I write a statement, I'm very careful to write it ex exactly. Okay, so the, I mean, I don't want to say something any function nearly saturates because I take the, the constant which depends on the function. This would be, would not help me to make any progress in any sense. Okay, but in two, I mean, I use it in an intuitive way. I mean, I, I mean that inversal constant is a small number, like five. You can think about just five. Uh, okay, this, this is the inversal constant, just in, in an intuitive way. But you don't write it down in theorem never like that. Yes. Yeah, yeah, we know, yeah, 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 yeah. We know, we know, we know that Poincaré constant is, 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 uh, is, is, the, is between, is a universal, con the Poincaré constant is something like one, it's between, between one-fifth and, one, and five for sure. Yeah, it's just true. So it, yeah, I think I wrote it, uh, so it's, this is the external case. More questions? Okay, so I'll, I'll think I'll, I'll, okay, so number six is going to be just an exercise, which is subadditivity. So if x and y are independent, then the Poincaré constant x plus y is at most the sum of these two things. Okay, let me now move to discuss applications. So, okay, so, so Poincaré studied this uh, Poincaré constant, uh, Poincaré inequality, because uh, applications to partial differential equations of mathematical physics, that's the name of his paper, especially the heat equation. Karl Lovich and Simonovich uh, were interested in algorithms for sampling points from high dimensional convex sets, and they ran some uh, Monte Carlo Markov chain algorithm whose mixing time depends on the uh, uh, Poincaré constant, so that's what, why they wanted to, to, to study this thing, and, and these algorithms are such sampling things are, is used in, in, in linear programming also sometimes. Um, there was other motivations. Keith Boy in the early 2000s related the, the scaleless conjecture to, to the slicing problem to discuss on Friday. So this in, uh, attracted the interest of the convex geometry community. Uh, but let me now, as there are some models in probability, in statistical physics, that are low concave in high dimensions, some Hamiltonian is convex, it could happen. Um, but, but our application for today 
is, is related to the uh, uh, center limit of all convex sets. Okay, so let, let me explain. Um, so what is the relation of the Poincaré inequality um, uh, to, to central limit theorem? Um, oh, actually, yeah, that's good. So we, we define, thanks to a question from the audience, we said that the random vector X is isotropic. Uh, if if we, we applied some transformation and made it centered, okay, and then we applied some transformation and made it covalent smart identity, and you can always apply some transformation and make it isotropic, okay? So that this is this is very good. Now, what is the relation of the Poincaré inequality to to the to the central limit theorem? Um, So what's the relation? So now it is done in two steps. So first of all, apply. So we, we start, let's say that, let, we start with isotropic random vector, not log concave, an isotropic random vector in Rn. So this is normalized. Isotropic means norm, it's not spherically symmetric like in some areas of mathematics. This just means normalized. Okay, it does not have to be, I think most of the examples that I showed you, the cube, the ball, the Gaussian, the exponential, all of them are either isotropic or up to little scaling they become isotropic. So this is very mild condition of normalization for us. That, that, that's it. Um, a random vector in Rn. Um, now, there are two things I want to say. First of all, what happens if you apply Poincaré inequality uh, for the function, which is just the Euclidean norm. What do we get? Well, we get that the variance of this function, the variance of the Euclidean norm of x, okay, is at most the Poincaré constant times the integral of this function square. But the gradient is just one, because this is one Lipschitz function. Right? The Euclidean norm is definitely one Lipschitz function, the distance from the origin. So I don't need the second term. And I get that the variance is at most the Poincaré constant, okay? And from here, if you use the Markov Chebyshev uh, inequality, you get that, um, that the probability that the equation of x is between, so you get root of n plus, I think, 3. I did it carefully, and I got 3. And root of n minus 3 to the root of x is at, 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 at least 1 half. Okay, let me, let me explain what's written here. So let's recall that x is isotropic. This means that the covariance is identity. So the expectation of x square is the sum of x1 squared, x2 squared, etc. So it's the trace of the covariance matrix, or it is n. And, and this means that the norm square is roughly n. So we'd expect the norm itself to be roughly root of n. And under political is indeed correct. You just, I mean, but you just, uh, this follows from this really in just little computation. So you get that um, the expectation of x is at least, the norm itself is at least root of n minus the Poincaré constant. Um, and it's most root of n by, by, uh, by uh, Cauchy-Schwarz. So you have this bound. Now this is an analytic bound, but what does it mean geometrically? This is a thin shell condition. Okay, so what is a thin shell condition? So let's draw two concentric circles. So that's one. That's the other. Okay, this is the origin. Okay, this is roughly root of n. And the distance, so this is, let's say, root of n minus the Poincaré constant. This is plus. Okay, and 
this set here, where x is between these two things, are minus 3. OK, 3. This area here corresponds to the event in this probability uh, <laughs> estimate there. And what we say is that th this is a thin shell. Thin because usually the Poincare constant uh, is, I mean, OK, we, we know it's at most log n in the local grave case. We think of it as uh, something that, say, goes logarithmically in the dimension. It's not a big number. Root of n is a big number. And CP of x is either constant, as in the case conjecture, or log n. This is the scale that we look at. Uh, ah, root. It cannot, does not make sense. It should be root here. Root everywhere is a root. It cannot be. Yeah, OK. This is meet, Poincare constant is meters squared. So root is distances. Not. OK. Um, now, um, OK, so this is the thin shell. And what we get from this estimate is that half of the mass x is in this thin spherical shell. So if you have a good Poincare inequality, in particular, we get this not completely obvious fact that there is a spherical, there is a sphere, that near this sphere, all of the mass of the random vector is located. So this is true for the Gaussian measure. This is true for the cube. This is true in the examples that we, we had earlier for the exponential measure. So there is a thin spherical shell that captures most of the mass. OK, this is a peculiar fact. But now, um, this is closely related to the phenomenon of Gaussian approximation. So this is uh, 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 due to Sudakov in the 70s. And Diakonis and Friedman in, the, in 1984, I think, yeah, 76, I think. And Diakonis and Friedman in, in 84, it's written in their works. Um, so, um, uh, under seals, under uh, isotropicity. And thin shell conditions. Most of the marginals of uh, the marginals of x are approximately Gaussian. So marginals, I mean, scalar product of x with some uh, fixed direction theta. Some, let me write it. Some com weighted combination of the coordinates, maybe sum of xi over root of n. That's a good, a good marginal. So this is an important principle uh, that follows from concentration of measure phenomena. Actually, I, I have a deja vu that I, 11 years ago, I gave lectures here in this auditorium about this thing. Uh, but we will not prove it, but just let us quote the uh, state of the art result in this thin shell business. So I need uh, to have, I will replace these two. So this go. This is number one. So this goes up, it's going down. Okay. So state of the art. On thin shell, right? So geometrically, the effect is that if the mass is close to a sphere, then in some sense the distribution looks roughly like the uniform measure on the sphere, which is known for centuries to have approximately Gaussian marginals. And analytically, we have the following theorem of Bobkov, uh, Chistyakov, who passed away recently, and Goethe. from 2020, so uh, let x be a random vector in Rn, isotropic, let's make it isotropic, and well, finite Poincare constant, let's assume, although you want it to be a small number so that it will be meaningful, uh, then there exists a subset uh, 
of the unit sphere. Okay, this is a subset of the good directions. The measure of this subset is very is quite large. Let's say that this is at least say 90% of the mass. Okay, this is the uniform probability measure on the sphere. Okay, so if, if you take a random point on the sphere, with 90% chance it's in this set. This is the good directions. And for any such good direction theta, if you look at the Kolmogorov distance between the margin of x in direction theta, okay, so this is the random variable on the real line, it should be pretty close to the Gaussian distribution. So if you look at the probability, so for any t in R, the probability that this thing will be at most t is very close to what you get for the Gaussian. So how close? This most universal constant times the Poincaré constant over n, but also here there is a log factor. So up to this log, this theorem looks very, very strong, optimal. So without the log, yeah, it cannot, up to the log, well, this is a universal constant. Okay, so this is why I tell you that if you know that the constant is roughly n, if you look at the diameter bounds even for the cube, okay? For the cube, the diameter is root of n, root of n squared is n. So if, if you just use the diameter bound in the Poincare constant, you would get that some probability that most number which is larger than one. So it's completely, does not give you any information about any, any Gaussian approximation for x times theta. However, as long as you know that Poincare constant is much smaller than n, right, now we know it's logarithmic, uh, you begin to understand that most of the marginals of x are, are approximately Gaussian, okay? So maybe some people here are used that independence of the random variables is crucial for Gaussian approximation. This is not at all true. So independence is one, one assumption that you could make, but another possibility to, to, is to obtain uh, a central limit theorem for dependent random variables is to assume finite Poincaré constant. But indeed, you need to know that you go below n. Let's ignore this log for a second. Let, I don't know, I'm not sure it's, it's completely needed. Um, but if you go below n, so this means that this is little of one, so you have some uh, Gaussian approximation, okay? And uh, for log concave, for x isotropic log concave, uh, we have uh, x is, I told you this is what is known. So we get log square. We get log of three, one of three. This is the state of the art right now. Okay, so this is about uh, application. Now, um, um, and in addition to applications, there is one, one okay, uh, nice thing about the subject of, of KLS and Poincaré inequalities, and this is the fact that, um, okay, so there are some applications, but also it's kind of, uh, um, the field is a bit of a playground for various techniques. Uh, what do I mean? So there are several techniques in mathematics that, that transcend convex geometry and are used in this business, and in fact, some of them were even invented in this business. And in these lectures, we'll discuss a couple of them. So for instance, there is the thing of convex localization or needle decomposition uh, uh, that we'll discuss uh, tomorrow. There's optimal transport. We do optimal transport only in L1, but also, also optimal transport in L2. Bernier map is uh, extremely useful. Uh, there are these techniques, the, the Bochner method, using curvature, uh, or the bottom technique, it's, it's useful. Semi-group tools, we'll see in, in, in Joseph's lectures. Um, stochastic localization, so losing the pass-wise analysis of the Brian motion is, is very useful. And there are two techniques that are used in this business that we'll not discuss at all. One is in geometric measure theory, so I don't know, we are a bit scared of the regularity theory. And also complex analysis, which are used mostly around the Bogan women inequality. These are two, 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 two techniques that we'll not use. Okay. Um, now, before um, um, going on and discussing methods of high dimension, let me say a few things about one-dimensional local distributions. Okay, so just let's see that we can understand many things there. So what can we say in one dimension, okay? Um, how do they look? Local distribution high dimension. So the answer is that uh, they all look like this. So this is R. Let me go, this is rho with the density of log curve measure. Uh, and rho is trapped between two things. 
So there is some exponential. Let, let me make it, uh, I, I, this is an exponential measure. And here there is some, okay, it does not have to be centered. I center, let me erase this axis, it's not centered. Then there is some Poisson function, and rho is somewhere in between. So rho is between these two things, okay? And this is the Barrett center, and this scale is the standard deviation. So basically, if you have one-dimensional one distribution, which is local and cave, you need to know two parameters. You need to know its Barrett center, and you need to know its standard deviation, and then you can bound it between two, two distributions, okay, more precisely. So, uh, so we have the following proposition. Uh, so in one dimension. So let X be an isotropic uh, local cave random variable, variable in R, let me emphasize. Uh, in R, okay. Uh, density is rho. Then, rho of x is smaller than e to the minus, let's say, uh, uh, c and, and c prime. For any x in r, rho is between an exponential and is larger than c tilde 1, uh, the of x smaller than c hat, okay? Where these are universal constants. Uh, capital C and C prime are universal constants. Okay, so if you centered your distribution, isotropic means means zero variance one. If you center it, it just you can find uh, exponential above and 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 and, and, and the indicator below. And, and for the proof, I won't do the proof. Let me just tell you hints. So one hint is, is the following. So basically, you have nothing to, to use except for the definition of low concave measure. Let me just do it one half. So this is the definition of low concave measure. This is follows from the definition of low concave measure. So you can see things like that. If this is the point of the maximal density, suppose you find another point where density goes down by one half. If density goes down by one half from low concavity, it has to go down exponentially after this point, for instance. So use tricks like that. Or if you know that the two points here, the density is, is not so small, and here it's not so small, also in between it's not so small because of these things, okay? So you just use little things like that. And actually, it's in one dimensional question. You could solve it by yourself, I guess. Okay, so, so that's one way to think about it. Let me just formulate a corollary, which is reverse Helder inequalities. Uh, so uh, uh, x is x is as above. Then for any p which is at least a minus one, the L2 norm of p, and L2 norm, the LP norm of x, which, which means expectation of x to the p to the one over p, it is at most goes at most linearly. And for below, it is at least um, uh, <coughs> p plus one and let's say one. Okay, and these are universal constants. Okay, so in particular, you can this helps you reverse mom because it's isotropic, so L2 norm is one. So the L4 norm is at most some number, the L minus half norm is most some number, etc. And just let me say, what is the zero norm? The zero norm is. Um, The zero norm is, is by limit. So this is interpreted by limit. Uh, 
is interpreted by unit. And one nice property of the zeros norm, it's not a norm. <laughs> I use this norm, it's norm only for PFT least one, is that if you have X and Y possibly dependent, it's kind of multiplicative. So the L2 norm of a product, the L0 norm is the product of the L0 norm. Okay, so let's, let's prove this corollary. I'll only do one half. The other half is the same complexity, so you can do it for yourself. So why, why do that? So, the, so let's assume enough. So for, let me just prove it for, uh, for, so by monotonicity in P, non-decreasing, enough to prove for P at least zero. Uh, this, the, this inequality, so this thing is, is, is equals the integral of uh, from minus infinity to infinity of x to the p rho of x dx, which is at most by the proposition what you get for the Gaussian. Some constant x to the p e to the minus little constant x dx. And this is some gamma function. You can write it down, and you see that it's at most some um, C, okay, let's say P at least one, why not? At least CP to the P, which means that this is, which, which solve this thing, and since the time is, it's already noon, then I'll leave this inequality for you to prove. It's also in the notes. Okay, so I'm done for today. Any questions before we go? Yes, please, please. Speak, speak loudly. So in one, okay, okay. Let me just say. So in one dimension, uh, because of some compactness, uh, it's pretty easy to prove things up to a constant. But the non-trivial question is to find the optimal constant in one dimension. Okay. So if you want to, to have the, the exact numbers that you can put here, this this is a, a delicate question, and I think the answers are known in some cases. For instance, I remember that the L3 norm is at most twice times the L2 norm. There are some things that are, some things are known, but I'm not going to discuss exact constants here. But these are indeed delicate analytic questions in one dimension. So I remember the constant in the KLS from the So the thing is, it must be bigger than Ah, I see. Oh, lower bound here. Uh, yeah, for the, yeah, right. Uh, we got, uh, so for the, ex Okay, for the uniform, we saw it's at least 12 over pi square. This was, uh, and for the exponential, you get something. So as far as I know, I, I, I doubt, I don't know any example which is worse than the exponential measure. Let me put it this way. I don't know any example which is worse. Yeah, I don't think that I know any. One-sided exponential. I don't know any example where it's worse than that. For one-sided exponential, it's one, I think four. Yeah, one-sided exponential. I think you get a factor of four. So at least at least four. At one. Exactly. I think that it's yeah. please. Is there any generalization of this to like is there any generalization of this to uh, spheres for instance or Yeah, you can look over, sure on, on the sphere, okay. So you can look on curvature dimension you know curvature dimension condition. So if you have a measure on the sphere, you want it to be isotropic, that's easy. We now find the right now. But now you don't want to take just delta measures on the on the standard unit vectors because this is zero point this is the infinite point constant. So you need to assume some kind of convexity condition. If you want to, in this business, you need some geometric condition of distribution on the sphere. So the natural thing is to look on what's called curvature dimension condition. That's the standard thing. It's a, a Bakri Emery. Uh, it's maybe conditions that would be discussed in Joseph's lecture. Would you do it? CD con no curvature measure. Uh, so yeah, I can tell you later. There is some natural condition on the measure. Roughly saying, it means that, uh, uh, okay, CD kappa n means that, so your density is e to the psi, and you want Hessian of, so now this is the Riemannian manifold. You want Hessian of psi plus grad psi tends or grad psi over n minus n uh, plus the Ricci, at least something like that. I mean, some, some expression like that, it uh, corresponds to the convexity of, 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 in our end, just say this is positive, convexity of the, of the, 
of the, of the log density. In many, many thought you add two parameters, n and kappa, and you kind of uh, discuss this thing. So yeah, it, it makes sense completely to conjecture on the sphere. Some, some class of functions satisfying curvature dimension condition do have a reverse uh, Poincare inequality supported roughly by the alpha. It's a completely legitimate conjecture, in my opinion. Okay, so bon appetit. See you tomorrow. See you in two. <laughs>